each of our coworkers, we kind of lose touch. Uh, so I attended the Lead Developer Conference back in June. Uh, it's a conference in London, and it will also be in February, it will be in New York City. Highly recommend it, even if you are not a lead developer, uh, to check it out. It's one of the best conferences I've ever gone to, even as a support lead. So um, if you go into the video section, there is a speaker at this conference, Melinda Seckington. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Uh, and she talked about hiring in the sense that you need to foster in your team uh, advocating for your company. So part of that, writing blog posts, getting people out to speak on behalf of your company, the easiest way to do this is to empower people to do this. Um, and she gave the suggestion of doing lightning talks in your company so you can, again, encourage people to go out and do this for you. Uh, so I brought this into Travis, and I think last week, or the week before, was our second ever Friday lightning talk. Uh, so, I'm going to go through just a few of the steps and things um, if you want to do this in your own teams. Uh, so, the first thing is to find a time that works for most people. Uh, and I'll mention why, you just have to make sure most people can attend. Uh, for us, for <laughs> and Travis, we just, we had a time set aside on Fridays uh, that there was a meeting posted but no one ever attended, it just was there. Uh, and it started way back at the beginning of the company. Uh, at least when I was there, we did a, a Friday check-in with everyone. We would go around and everyone had their chance to say what they were working on and they were working on any cool projects. Uh, when we grew to about 20 people, it just wasn't practical anymore. Uh, so it moved to being just a check-in with the teams. How is your team doing? What is your team doing? Uh, that stopped working. Uh, so it turned into just being a check-in with leadership or if a team had a big process update that they had to share. And that stopped working after a while. Doing it weekly just wasn't practical. Not everyone could make it every week. Uh, so we changed it into a monthly all hands uh, where Matthias, our CEO, does a big update overall. So then we had this void in our lives where we weren't communicating with our coworkers, having that water cooler chat. Uh, so someone created the fireside chat in the place of what we had before. Uh, but no one was curating it. No one was getting people involved in, in the chat room. So it kind of fell by the wayside. So I used this time, the, the meeting that was already scheduled that no one attended, uh, and filled the void with uh, a bi-weekly Friday lightning talk. So now you actually want to do this. You found a time that works for most people. Uh, now you have to get speakers. Uh, I do this with a really simple form. There's three questions. What do you want to talk about? How long are you going to talk for? And do you have to screen share? Because that will be something that you need for the tool uh, that you're going to use. And talks can be about anything. I tell people you can talk about your hobby. You can talk about side projects or work projects. You can talk about blog posts or books that you've read. Um, the most important thing, though, is to set an example in the first meeting and to present a lightning talk yourself. I talked about how to give lightning talks. Uh, another, apparently my last two lightning talks have been meta. Uh, and I threatened to talk about crafting at every single lightning talk event if no one was set up to present. Uh, so that thread still stands, <laughs> just to hear All right, uh, the third point is to use the right tool. Uh, for us, we use Zoom record and screen share. Uh, I highly recommend it. It is a paid tool, but um, it works really well for us. Uh, create a schedule using the form that everyone filled out for you. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have to get stuck on formalities of releasing a schedule every week and making sure everyone's available or time slots, which what order do you want to go in. Uh, do something that works for you. I ping everyone and slap the day before and just say, this is the order, here's how long you have. Um, and so it doesn't, you just don't have to be formal about it. Uh, and then hold your first ever lightning talks. Um, you can determine the frequency for what works for you. Like I said, we're trialing by weekly, uh, but whatever works for you. So in that first session, uh, you need to set expectations. Um, and for us, that included talking about our code of conduct, because even internal events, 
thinking, this is the dumbest person in the world. <laughs> that could be true. But, the next time you're looking for a job, right, there's this mechanical HR process you have to get through. So, the bad news is you have to keep LinkedIn up to date. It's got to be something like what your resume looks like. And it's got to have the buzzwords there. But I'm, I'm sure I haven't sold you on any part of that. Because who has a great story, or maybe a thousand stories, about on LinkedIn, someone you don't know endorsing you for things you don't do? <laughs> right? So it, the, their web of trust doesn't, doesn't work. So what if I also said that when you start a new job, you join a new organization, you should make sure on LinkedIn you connect with everyone in the company. Everyone. That's okay. I'm anchoring the dumbest person in the world thing. I understand. Uh, what if I told you that no matter how much you love your team, no matter how much you love your coworkers or your product or your service, you're going to work with people that are Jerks. You're going to work with people that are terrible at their job, and you realize that the only skill they have is interviewing, and why haven't we fired them yet? This is the upside down web of trust for LinkedIn. You use it as a web of distrust. You make sure you connect with everyone you hate in the world. <laughs> Connect with all of the awful people you know that you never want to work with again. And the next gig you're looking for, see if anybody there has endorsed the people you love. <laughs> <laughs> because it is a great tool to avoid jerks. <laughs> you just have to connect with them on LinkedIn. Really just it's the, the a web of mistrust, right? And if you have, you, you've seen it, right? You, somebody new, they join a new big company, and within two weeks, they have 50 endorsements for some pinnacle skill that, you know, master of problem solver. How did you demonstrate that to 50 people in two weeks? Come on, Simmons, you can't do that. So those people are all kind of crappy at their jobs. <laughs> It's like a web of mediocrity. So, yes, you have to use LinkedIn. Just don't use it the way they want you to. <laughs> I would love to write a bot to just do this for us, but they would kill that API. Like, whatever enabled that to work, they would kill it immediately. So, maybe I'll write it and I'll secretly distribute it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> It's really meant for like technical people that know Ruby, so if you're not much of a technical person or you don't know Ruby, feel free to reach to me afterwards and I'll just explain you everything I mean here. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to talk to you about this programming language called uh, Elixir. So, uh, what is Elixir? Elixir is a functional language. You, yes, Elixir is a functional language, so you basically don't really use objects, you just shape everything you do in terms of functions. Elixir is created by this guy that we share the same name with, called Jose Valin. And uh, Elixir runs on top of the Erlang virtual machine, which I think is one of the most interesting things of this language. The Erlang virtual machine is, is what runs Erlang, and it was created by Ericsson, I think, in the 70s to power these telephone switches. So, in the core of this virtual machine is reliability, because if you're making a phone call that lasts a month, the system kind of go down, but at the same time, they had to still ship like software updates and all of that, so it had to be very, very resilient. Um, oh, for the ones that don't know, Jose Valin, he was part of, I don't think he's still anymore, but he was part of the Rails 4 team, so like he worked, he's like a super active member of the Ruby community. And um, Elixir is heavily, heavily inspired by, by Ruby. So I thought that. I would just introduce you to some of my favorite features of Elixir, and if you want to know more about it, just like feel free to reach me afterwards. So the, one, of, one of the first things I was impressed by Elixir is this thing called pattern matching. I don't know if you can see the code. 
Um, but basically, what you tell the language is that it should match whatever's to the left to whatever's to the right. So in this case, I'm telling it to assign to the variable first and to the variable second the first two elements of the array that you see over there. So then this is kind of like ERB, I mean like uh, IRB. So if I say first, it will have the value one because it's the first element, and then two, it will have the value two. And it's kind of like algebra in a way that if you give it like an expression that actually is not valid, it will just create an error for you. The cool thing about this is that it's super, super, super powerful. So what you're seeing here, what you're seeing here is that, for example, I have this sort of like, like a Ruby hash that has the username being whatever, and then it has other values. And then on the on the second line, what I'm telling it to do is basically, yeah, what I'm telling it to do is basically to sort of extract some information out of that hash. Oops, there we go again, out of that hash. So then like, I can use the variable, which I think it's also super, super interesting. As we go deeper, you'll see why this is nice. Um, we also have, like we saw yesterday, in crystal function overloading. So for example, you can define the same function, but the language uses pattern matching. So say I want to call the function make sound, and the first argument is cow. This is like a root symbol. It will just say boom. If the second argument is cat, it will say meow. And if, if it's something else, it will just put like a shrug, which I think is pretty nice. Uh, but it goes as far as that, so then you can also put pattern matching in this. So the same way I extracted information from the hash before, what I'm telling it here, what I'm, hello, yeah, what I'm telling it here is that now this function will only work if I pass it a hash, and the value for the key animal is going to be cat. And the same way I do the pattern matching, I can extract the value of the key animal into name, and then I can use it in the body of the function, which I think is also super nice. Um, just like I think we saw this morning about uh, Swift, we also have guard classes. So here we define two functions, and say you're passing a variable that's called downtime, this one will only execute if the content of the variable is less than, it's less than 10. Whereas this one will do the opposite. The other one will do the opposite. You get the idea. So those are some features, and you can mix all of that. Um, in Elixir, we also get this pipe operator. So, what I'm doing in the first two lines is basically defining one line functions. So, the first one is just, it's called add one. I pass in a number, and then we'll just add one to it. The second one is called multiply by three. I pass in a number, and it just multiplies it by three. In Ruby, you would do something like multiply by three, add one, and then the argument is one, and then you get six out of it. In Elixir, you can do, you can use the pipe operator, which is this funny thingy that you see over there. That what it does is basically, whatever's to the left is going to be the first argument of whatever's to the right. So over here, I think it's much, much simpler to read actually what's happening with the code, which you can ex extrapolate. And I think it just makes the code much, much more readable whenever you're working functionally. Yes, so uh, those are some of the features and you can mix all of that. As I told you before, uh, Elixir is built on top of the Erlang virtual machine, which is one of the core features it has is distributed computing. So, apparently, this is slightly more complicated. It's this is very similar to the Go channels that you were seeing before. What I'm doing over here is that I'm assigning the current process. All right. So in in, in Erlang and in Elixir, you get these processes which are sort of like very very lightweight threads. They're not really threads, but they can act like that. So what I'm doing over here. I'm assigning in the first variable the, the current thread. Then I'm spawning a new process that will send to the current thread a message saying hello world. And then this other one will block until it receives a message. And then it will just print the content of the message. So if you know about Go channels, like what we saw yesterday, this is very similar to that. The same with crystal channels, I guess. Uh, the cool thing about this is that without changing any piece of my code, this message passing can run in different computers. So, say I have two machines. In the first machine, in the first machine, I just set it to block until it receives a message. In the second machine, I create sort of a reference to the first machine and send a message. And then the early virtual machine takes care of passing the message from one machine to the other. So, if the architecture are coding the right way, you can just have it running on parallel computers. Uh, without having to change anything from your code, which I think is really, really amazing. 
Um, yeah, so that's like a very small intro to Elixir. What is Phoenix? Phoenix, so according to their website, is a productive web framework that doesn't compromise the speed and maintainability. I think of it as basically Rails but cooler. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to talk about one feature because lots of things are very, very similar, but this is a good example of one of my favorite features actually from Elixir. By the way, you can tell that Jose really suffered. Jose really suffered from Ruby in the Rails community and he saw the mistakes we sort of made over there and tried to make it better in a much more functional way. Over here, I'm doing what you would do in Active Record of, is, this is kind of like a mix between strong parameters and validation in one line. So I'm defining this method that takes two arguments. Say, say the instance of your model and some parameters. This line just extracts the email address and first name sort of parameters from the params hash and then passes that and validates that the email address is present. So say you can use this for the new user sign up. So you don't want them to enforce that they set a first name but you want to enforce an email address. You, with the second function, you can build on top of the first one and say that you also require the first name that you can use for like whenever the user updates their profile afterwards which to me is like composing validations is something so essential for web development but we just don't have it in Rails and uh, oh yeah, I work for Shopify, we're hiring so if you'd like to work there, uh, hit me up my Twitter account is Jojo and yeah, that's it, thank you
And then we're going to carry up the after, I promise. <laughs> and that's it. Thanks. Hey, thank you. All right, so I wrote this in like, well, the first half of the first lightning talk, so bear with me, it's a little scattered. Uh, this is titled, If We Go to Karaoke, What Will You Sing? <laughs> And the reason I'm asking that is because this is an interview question that I use when I'm screening candidates for uh, database or application support positions at Engineer. And one of the reasons we ask, or I ask this question, is uh, because I don't actually meet the people I hire until six months to a year after I hire them. Uh, because we're pretty much a completely remote team. So this is the type of question that doesn't have a right or wrong answer, uh, but it's designed to reach out and make a connection with the candidate that you're speaking with and get a sense for how that person might or might not fit on your team. Uh, it's about generating a conversation, hopefully something that lasts longer than two or three minutes. And of course, I still ask about technical details, so MySQL, Somebody applying as a MySQL DBA, I might ask, what is the most important feature you see in MySQL 5.7? Um, but there again, the goal is to make it a conversation opener, something that becomes a free-flowing discussion between you and the, the candidate that you're talking to. Because I don't want to sit there and go through a whole bunch of HRE questions. We have HR for that. Well, we used to anyway. <laughs> um, so another one that I like to use is, uh, have you ever attended any technology conferences? And here again, there is no right or wrong answer. A lot of people don't get the opportunity to go to technical conferences, but it is an important aspect of what we at Engineer do. And we do try to send our team to technical conferences at least once a year for each employee. And um, we want to see if is the person even interested in going to a technical conference? Will they get involved in the community? Which leads to the question, have you attended any local meetup groups? Um, you know, that's something that whether your company sends you or not, you can be involved in. You just, it's kind of a matter of making the time. And yeah, we all have busy schedules, but I mean, what's once a month? Or once every two months? Or once every six months, right? Um, and, and uh, another question that I'd like to ask is, have you written any public blog posts or documentation or contributed to any open source projects? Again, no right or wrong answer, we're all busy people, but this can give you a sense for how people write, what their thought process is, and, um, and, and how well they write. And you don't need everybody on your team to be the most expert writer, and that's fine, but it gives you a sense for who this person is. Um, so, when we go to karaoke, what are you going to sing? Thank you. Today, I guess I'll just say, all shucks. Uh, we're fortunate I did not bring my HDMI cable for this, so I won't try to show you my 20 minute talk that usually takes an hour and I'm just going to give you a couple of high spots. And essentially, this is something that I like for everybody in the world to think about. Okay. Uh, this week, recently, Slashdot told me that The Guardian had an article that said Forrester consulting people said, we'll lose 6% of our jobs by 2021 to automation. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's a low number. I guess there's no way to really know. Uh, I know because I've been following this for a while that lots of jobs have been evaporating. And people complain about sending work overseas like manufacturing work. I read an article several years ago. GE brought one manufacturing line for one appliance back here, but they do it with about a third of the people because everything is automated. It's not only in manufacturing, it's service jobs, it's middle management jobs. There used to be a lot of people whose whole job was to pass notes back and forth up and down the ladder. They have been replaced. Uh, doctors are being assisted by systems that do diagnoses. There's just all kinds of things going on. And, you know, we could, I could give you numbers forever. I wouldn't make a point in this. Uh, when you talk about this, there's optimists and pessimists. The optimists 
and so dynamically and so much that this time is different and we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the other thing about this is that new jobs are created. They're usually not appropriate jobs for the people who lost their jobs. Uh, I started teaching Buffalo Tech, Buffalo State, excuse me, around the time that steel plant closed in Lackawanna. And we did have some people came in and struggled to educate themselves to find some new career because they knew that what they were doing was dead. God bless them. Not everybody does that. Not everybody is capable of doing that. Right? So even if there are new jobs, people in transition get hurt. Like right now is a little different, but be a lot of talk on the political scene about coal miners. Well, coal miners are losing jobs because we want to fight global warming and those jobs are going away and there's no magical thing we can ever do to make them come back. What are those people going to do? Maybe we should train them. So I, don't really know the, I don't really know the answer, but I'm going to tell you this ahead of time. Everybody's looking at me kind of blank. I hope that means you're thinking. If they are, 
scriptural amendment says unconference. And you will find a little write-up, and you will find a link to the slides that you have been spared this afternoon. <laughs> and, and, and we go off and at least think about it. 